Excellent. With that, I would like to say good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome back to our um, uh, transdisciplinary seminar series. We are thrilled this morning to be joined by Dr. Gina Martin, um, who will be talking to us about some of her research. Uh, before I hand over the floor, let me introduce Gina uh, more formally. So Dr. Martin is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Disciplines at Athabasca University. Gina's research focuses on understanding how the physical and social neighborhoods where young people live, play, and learn influences their well-being. Much of her research involves using quantitative techniques and mixed methods to examine health inequalities. Recently, Dr. Martin has worked extensively on projects studying patterns of adolescent well-being and substance use in both the Canadian and the Scottish contexts. So we're so thrilled to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I will hand the floor over to you. Hi, thanks so much, uh, Jessica, for that nice introduction. Um, so yeah, as Jessica said, I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Disciplines at Athabasca University. Um, Athabasca University has learners and faculty from all over uh, Canada. Um, but I'm coming to you from London, Ontario, so I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenape-Hawak, and Chen'ungtan nations whose uh, traditional lands I am coming to you from today. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you about um, some work that I've done uh, with some colleagues looking at the emotional impacts of climate change on children. Um, so I have just down in this slide uh, an image, this is, uh, actually doesn't have the journal name, but it's the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Journal. Um, so this work is published in a special issue in Child and Youth Mental Health and the Global Ecological Crisis. So if this speaks to you or is of interest, I would encourage you to take a look at the special issue. There's a lot of um, interesting research in there to, to acquaint yourself with. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors on the scoping review um, that I'm largely going to be presenting from. So that's Haley Everett, Kristen Riley, and Jason Gilliland, and also my colleagues Tasha Roswell and Martin Anderson, who are at Athabasca University. Um, and we're working on um, some, some work now trying to fill some of the research gaps that I'll highlight a little bit more later. Um, so just to provide a bit of um, context, I'll go into some background, then I'll present mostly from the scoping review, but because this is an emerging area and that's gonna be a theme in this talk, um, you, I'm gonna present a little bit of uh, more recent work that's come out since the scoping review was published, just a few um, important um, pieces of note, but there is a lot of other research that's been coming out. Um, and then I'm just gonna have some um, concluding thoughts and, and then I'll be open for questions. So climate change is well acknowledged now to have impacts on human health. So a few of the um, major impacts that it's known to have will be and are illness, injury, and increased water and vector-borne diseases, to name a few. Um, the World Health Organization and the Medical Journal The Lancet have both called climate change um, uh, one of the greatest health threats of this century. Um, in response, we do see a lot of um, organizations and Canadian organizations, you know, um, coming to the challenge. The Canadian Nurses Association has put out a position statement, and there's the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment doing a lot of work in this area. Um, so I just want to highlight that, that there is work being done um, in this area. However, um, climate change not only has implications for physical, mental, or physical well-being and uh, health, it also has implications for mental health and well-being. And compared to other health areas, largely physical health, um, the mental health impacts have received much less research attention until um, just recently. And this is a growing area, um, and we need this research in order to support evidence-based adaptation strategies, in order to better support people as with their mental health as we live in this, uh, this context. 
So in terms of climate change and mental well-being, um, Hayes et al. has done some work and sort of classified or categorized the types of impacts that we see on mental well-being from being part of um, this time where we're experiencing the climate crisis and how things are likely to move forward. So we see direct impacts. So these are the mental health impacts that are related to experiencing uh, an extreme weather event um, related to climate change. So this could be living in an area that's experiencing a flood or a hurricane, wildfires, and this could manifest in um, experiencing post-traumatic stress, um, depression from, you know, all the, the stress that comes from experiencing these types of events. There's also indirect impacts. So these are the mental health consequences that occur from the social, economic, and environmental disruptions um, stemming from climate change. So for example, this could be stress from migration, um, disruption in food supplies, so this can be indirect, you might not be um, potentially experiencing it. However, there's some stress that's stemming because of changing all the systems um, surrounding us. And then there's also the overarching awareness impacts. And that's what I'm gonna focus on um, in this talk. And this was the focus of the scoping review. So this is the emotional distress from um, having an overarching awareness of the threats and impacts of climate change on the current and future of well-being of humans and the planet. Um, so sometimes you see this uh, termed as climate anxiety um, in uh, the media, this um, terminology has sort of taken hold. Um, and so this is sort of just trying to um, acknowledge that there's an emotional distress and you could potentially not be experiencing a direct impact, but just this awareness can still lead to an emotional distress. So this largely relates to the, um, the idea of eco-emotions or earth emotions. And so this is uh, the distress or anxiety or worry or fear that are stemming from this overarching awareness. And so we can sort of think of this under the umbrella term of psychoterratic syndromes. Uh, psychoterratic syndrome is a term coined by Glenn Albrecht, who is an environmental philosopher um, based out of Australia. And so um, the psychoterratic or the positive and negative uh, emotions that we feel from our felt experience of the earth, um, whereas the psychoterratic syndromes are broadly defined as the psychological responses to negative changes to the state of the earth. And so we can see that um, in a lot of the terminology we see today. So eco-anxiety, climate anxiety, eco-grief, um, eco-distress, um, and this idea of solastalgia, which is another term um, coined by Glenn Elbrick, and this is sort of the, the lack of feeling of solstice or uh, solace in our um, environment due to the negative uh, changes we see. So it's sort of that sense of feeling homesick while at home um, in connection to the natural environment. Um, it's important now in this sort of part of the talk for me to sort of highlight that experiencing negative emotional responses to the climate crisis is a rational, normal, and a potentially functional reaction to the serious issues facing the planet. Um, so it's important not to necessarily pathologize all these feelings. Um, a lot of people are experiencing them, um, and this is a rational response. Um, so what we see in the literature is that these emotional reactions to climate change are often um, thought to be either adaptive or maladaptive, or sometimes this is termed constructive or unconstructive. And it can be adaptive in that um, these emotions can lead to a motivation to act, but these emotions can also be overwhelming and difficult for people to deal with. And they can be maladaptive when they start to interfere with an individual's ability to function. And they could also um, lead to inactivity or a lack of motivation to act. So that's just sort of the, the debate that's currently ongoing. And so when it comes to the consequences of climate change, children are widely recognized as a dis disproportionately at risk group. Um, the physical and social development and developmental trajectories that children are um, undergoing through their childhood puts them at particular risk to the, um, the changes that are occurring because of climate, the climate crisis. Um, physically, children are more vulnerable to the direct effects of extreme heat, drought, and natural disasters. 
This relates to the concept of intergenerational justice or intergenerational injustice in this case. And that's that today's children and future generations are going to bear a disproportionate share of the burden of climate change. Um, and this is going to affect their well-being through many pathways. And so we've seen this, um, this sort of the idea of our emotional reactions to climate change really take hold in media lately. Um, in 2019, uh, the online publication, uh, Grist Magazine, called uh, climate anxiety the biggest pop culture trend of the year. Um, we see therapists um, and psychologists saying that they're increasingly seeing young people coming in, um, experiencing you know, climate anxiety or worries. Um, and they're working with children and young people to try to deal with that. And we see that this is really taken hold in media. Um, so given the fact that we know that this is something that has um, a lot of relevance, we see young people at the forefront of a lot of action um, taking place. We see young people and children uh, taking legal action against governments. So we know that this is something that's important to young people. We see it taking an increasing um, media amount of space um, and being highlighted in the media. We wanted to know more about what sort of evidence is out there. Um, so for that, we underwent a scoping review. So for those of you who are familiar with the different um, review types, a scoping review compared to a more systematic review tends to be a bit more broad. So the goal of a scoping review is really to identify or map out the type of evidence that is available. Um, it can be really good for clarifying concepts. So in this case, it was very useful because we do see different terminology um, being used. Uh, it tends to have a broader research objectives than a more systematic review, which might have a more focused research objective. objective. Again, really good for identifying where the gaps in the knowledge and the evidence are. And so another difference is here um, when doing a, a scoping review, quality of evidence is often less of a concern. So we're not interested in um, highlighting what the best evidence is or making any sort of definitive statements around that. It's more sort of giving a mapping of the lay of the evidence. And so given that this is an emerging area and that there's not that much known, this seemed like the, the most appropriate review method. Um, the other thing is that often this can uh, precede a, a systematic review. So you can see where there might be more scope to you know, do more research that's um, based on some very specific objectives. So we went with this route um, because our objectives were more broad. So specifically, our objectives were to identify and provide an overview of research regarding the impact of climate change awareness on children's mental well-being and negative emotions. So we really just wanted to know what, what evidence is out there. We wanted to be able to summarize and potentially clarify some terminology related to climate change awareness and children's mental well-being and their negative emotions. And we wanted to be able to make some recommendations for areas of future research based on the existing evidence. Um, and again, so if the you're interested in this work, it's published in the special issue that's just out now in Child and Adolescent Mental Health. So our inclusion criteria, so the studies we included, um, we only wanted studies that were looking at young people aged three to 19. We wanted that school aged group just to avoid um, the, the differences that might be experienced for people as they are transitioning into the workforce or into um, university. So it was really trying to get at these school-aged years. So we looked at published and unpublished empirical studies. Um, so grade literature, anything really um, was included. We included um, conference abstracts, so it didn't have to be peer reviewed. Um, we included reviews, editorials, and commentaries, and opinion papers. Um, we searched, I think, eight academic databases and three unpublished grade literature databases. Um, we did the search on January 10th, 2020. So that was quite a while ago. So what we did, it took us a while to go through all the literature and classify it. So then at that point, we actually updated it. So that was in April of 2021. 
Um, so bear that in mind when we're looking at the results and that this is an emerging area. And that's why I'm going to um, then present a, a bit more, uh, more recent work. Um, yeah, and so that was our approach. And we also, because we wanted to include and be as broad as possible, any article that was um, looking at more adult populations, but then had a section or statements around children specifically was included. So some of the papers that we had were more geared towards um, adults, but then they had a section or some statements, particularly around children. So the important takeaway from this is that we had about 2,000 papers to screen in the end. We had 17 that we included, but then when we updated our search, we found 10. So I think that that's important to kind of note that this is an emerging area. So that update really did um, contribute quite a bit to um, the studies we were looking at. Um, we also did backward citations, so that's where we went through our references and then included studies. We basically screened our references in all the, in all the studies we had. And that was because when we did our grade literature research, we weren't really finding very much. Um, our databases weren't providing much grade literature that we were reading about when we were reading the studies that were included. So it was really to try to be inclusive of the, the grade literature there. So in the end, we had our 33 articles that were included in this work. Um, three were grade literature. Um, the majority, though, were more theoretical. So I think this is a really important finding that, you know, this is an area that's getting a lot of media attention, but there's not actually a lot of empirical work. There's some very nice theoretical work um, out there. Um, so we had a lot of reviews. Um, most of them weren't systematic reviews. They were more uh, theoretical or uh, narrative approaches. Um, five editorials or commentaries, and one was actually a tutorial for parents. Um, and then we had 13 empirical studies, and you know, it was pretty mixed. We had some mixed methods, uh, three qualitative studies, and seven quantitative studies. Um, a lot of studies didn't report our age group separately, and so weren't able to be included because they lumped in um, children with adult populations. So of the empirical research, uh, the majority were from Europe, North America, and Australia. So we're seeing some big research gaps in terms of how, um, about where the studies are coming from. Um, I will note though, there was very, there wasn't very much from Canada. I think there was one study from Canada. Um, the theoretical works were global in nature. However, they usually noted that there was a, a lack of research um, coming from from um, regions other than, yeah, Europe, North America, and Australia really dominated. 70% um, of the articles were published in the last five years. So again, this really highlights this is an emerging area and we're starting to see the, the research coming out now, um, more so than in previous uh, years. But these terminologies that are sort of purpose-built around uh, emotions and the way that we're feeling around climate change, so things like nostalgia, climate anxiety, eco-grief, these were appearing in these more recent articles, but there was work done before this. Um, so these earlier articles would just use, you know, worrying about climate change or stress around climate change. Uh, they were kind of situated in that context, but not really using this sort of purpose-built terminology. We found that a lot of the um, concepts were differing when we looked at how they were defined. So the, the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health um, defined eco-anxiety as being characterized by low mood, disturbed sleep, and panic attacks. So this is sort of um, highlighting uh, an interruption in functioning and also encompassed feelings of anger, guilt, and helplessness. So it had... Um, functioning and emotions all yeah, characterized into eco-anxiety. Whereas Gifford and Gifford distinguished between eco-anxiety and habitual ecological worrying, saying that, you know, ecological worrying was associated with proactive behavior, whereas eco-anxiety was a more severe, um, a more severe emotion that was uh, met with a loss of appetite, sleeplessness, and panic attacks. So although there was some difference in how the terminologies um, were defined, we did see some, um, some common threads in that, you know, loss of um, sleep or panic attacks did show up in several definitions. 
the vast majority of the studies addressed anxiety or worry, and that was among um, the theoretical works and the empirical works. However, in the theoretical works, it was also noted that children experience distress, fear, guilt, powerlessness, hopelessness, helplessness, anger, despair, phobia, grief, and sadness, among some emotions. Um, one empirical study did go beyond anxiety or worry and looked at despair and also to measured climate change concern. Uh, it's important to note that the one study was, that was done with the U.S. Uh, with a U.S. population of children, looked at despair and also concern. Concern was um, similar to worry in that it used elements of worry in its measure and actually found that in terms of being uh, proactive in terms of environmental behavior, despair was negatively related. So more despair meant um, the children were less likely to engage in pro-environmental behavior, whereas being more concerned, they were more likely to engage in pro-environmental behavior. So this sort of indicates that there could be something around these differing emotions and trying to be a bit more nuanced in terms of how we look at these things. So from the empirical findings, it was very consistent um, that across the studies, the majority of children expressed negative emotions about climate change, uh, particularly in more recent studies. So it doesn't really matter how it's measured. It tends to be the majority of children or adults reporting on children were saying, you know, we're, we're seeing um, this as an issue. So, for example, um, a study of U.S. teachers and parents that asked if their children were experiencing stress or anxiety about climate change, 67% said they were, um, at least moderate uh, distress or stress or anxiety. In a study of Australians or an Austrian uh, 12 to 13 year olds, they were asked if climate change was probably or definitely something we should worry about. So it wasn't asking necessarily about their feelings, but whether they felt, you know, in general, we should be worried. And you can see that the majority, um, so over 80% 80, 80 said that they did feel it was something we should be worried about. Um, and looking at, you know, 12 to 13 year olds in a outpatient child um, psychiatry practice, 66% reported some symptoms of anxiety because of hearing about climate change. And again, 88% reported either a, a little or, or a lot or a little concern about climate change. So there was some concern there. So this is pretty consistent. So this is definitely something that, you know, we need to be looking into and thinking about more in terms of research work and, um, and developing strategies to support young people. Um, there was a bit of evidence that levels of anxiety and worry are higher among older adolescents than younger adolescents and children. Um, so a paper from, you know, 2013, these sort of earlier on uh, works showed that, you know, 29% of Swedish children or early adolescents were worried about climate change, but this was 62% in late adolescents. Um, this might be different if we were to run these polls again today, um, but this sort of indicates that there could be some, some um, increasing level of worry as children are aging. Uh, there weren't very many studies that looked at gender. Those that did uh, found mixed findings. Um, again, very few studies examine the relationship between the emotions about climate change and more general uh, indicators of mental well-being. So this could be such as um, generalized anxiety measures or looking at uh, self-rated mental health or well-being. So very few actually looked at whether having negative emotions about climate change actually impacted or was associated with general mental well-being. Um, and again, those that did, uh, the findings were quite mixed. Um, so some studies did look at the coping strategies and how young people and children were coping um, with these emotions. And this was associated with general mental well-being and also pro-environmental behaviors. And so I just note that this um, because it's an area um, that I think is worth looking into. So Maria Oyala identifies three coping strategies in her work. Um, in terms of looking at how young people are dealing with their worry about climate change. Um, so the first is problem focus. So that's trying to do something about the problem. So this could be, for example, reading a book to try to learn more about it, um, talking to people, um, 
then there's also de-emphasizing coping. So this is downplaying the seriousness of the issue. And third, there's meaning-focused coping. So this is promoting hope. And this is a, a more realistic hope, not a wishful thinking type of hope, but a hope that's grounded in, in reality and also finding meaning. And so part of this can be having trust in social actors, for example. Um, so this could be having trust in other adults or having trust in adults um, to do the right thing or to um, potentially have some trust in politicians. Um, and this sort of is looking at taking uh, a realistic view about the situation and then trying to find some positives within it. So again, I highlighted this because this is a potentially promising area. Um, so some early work, and I think we just need more work to look into this, but problem-focused coping has been found in, um, in some earlier research to be linked with lower levels of general mental well-being and higher levels of pro-environmental behavior. So we can see, you know, it might be uh, an adaptive strategy in terms of being uh, more pro-environmentally active, but it, it's also related to lower levels of general mental well-being, which is not something we would potentially want to see with children. Um, De-emphasizing the issue is related to higher levels of general mental well-being, which again, that's a good thing. However, uh, lower levels of pro-environmental behavior, which is again, something we don't want to see um, moving forward in terms of you know, wanting to see action uh, in terms of climate crisis and positive change. However, meaning-focused coping um, was related to higher levels of gen general mental well-being and higher levels of pro-environmental behavior. So this could be a protective coping strategy, potentially, um, and I think is definitely somewhere where we could be looking um, in terms of more research in order to better support children moving forward. So, what did we conclude from our scoping review? More research is needed. We definitely need more regional coverage. Um, so that's not just different countries, but also looking within countries, um, looking at ranges of communities and cultural contexts. So for example, urban rural differences, um, particularly some regions that are geographically vulnerable or have experienced um, issues because uh, or extreme weather events because of the climate crisis. Um, you know, uh, some communities are going to be more linked to the land culturally and for livelihood. And so needing to understand those differences. Um, there could also be differences within populations by socioeconomic status. We could see that this, um, this has the potential to widen inequities. And so how young people understand that could also be um, of issue when they're dealing with this and trying to understand it and feeling their emotions. Um, we need more work on younger children and early adolescents. Um, that sort of over 16 year old group tends to be um, the most studied and so we need more work going forward. Um, again, we need some longitudinal studies, so studies that are following the same group of young people over time and seeing how they're feeling. Um, how they're feeling now and then as they move forward as the as the climate crisis evolves and we see changes how that impacts their emotions um, how their activities and their coping strategies then lead to um, potentially action so that's something we need to see more of um, also acknowledging that different emotions can exist um, and understanding these different emotions and coping strategies as i talked about earlier um, and I'd argue that, you know, we really want to be looking at these differing emotions and coping strategies as a way to inform our understanding of um, adaptive or maladaptive emotional responses. So looking at how different emotions and coping strategies impact on functioning, um, how it impacts on senses of general well-being, um, and also on pro-environmental behaviors. So I'm just going to now highlight some more recent work, um, just to kind of end on, um, just to end on um, some more contemporary things that are happening, particularly because a lot of the research gaps that we highlighted are things that there is work coming out now. So I think it's important to kind of highlight what exists um, currently. 
Um, so some recent work, uh, which is in the same special issue, so if you want to check it out, um, looked at online content. Um, so this is with 16 to 25 year olds. This paper actually wouldn't have made it into the scoping review because of including that older age group. Um, but I think it's really interesting because it does look at particularly online content, which is where a lot of information is coming from. And so in their paper, they found that uh, reducing blame, anxiety, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness were all cited as important in making climate change coverage on social media more effective. And also that positive stories and practical small things individuals could do were also recognized as helpful. So I think that that kind of highlights um, that there is more work coming out and that, you know, a lot of it is looking at specific contexts. And in this case, it was sort of the digital content um, that young people were exposed to. Um, so there's also some work that has been done uh, looking at cross-national differences. So when I talked about that gap in, in regional differences, there's been some nice work that's been done really recently. Looking at young people, again, in that kind of older age group, um, so 10,000 young people in 10 different countries. And, and, and again, this was consistent with what we found in that most countries, uh, more than 50%, so the majority were saying they were very or too extremely worried. Um, and with two exceptions, that was the UK and Finland, but they were just, you know, under the 50% mark. Um, the countries that expressed more worry tended to be those that were more directly impacted by climate change at present. So, for example, the Philippines, um, there were over 80% of young people reporting that they were extremely uh, to very worried. And this was related to a perceived failure um, by governments to respond to the climate crisis. And so this is a really important aspect too, because we need to, and, and this again highlights the need for longitudinal studies, we need to understand the role that um, government's actions can play in young people's emotions. And it really highlights the need to validate their distress by taking urgent action and um, that the government's uh, actions do uh, potentially um, have impact on this increasing worry. There's also a, a, a longitudinal study that's come out, which is great to see. And this followed Australians from the age of 10 to 19. And so this study found that adolescents with high persistent worry had higher depression symptoms at 18 to 19 years of age um, compared to a moderate worry group, um, while those with increasing worry did not. And the high persistence and increased worry groups actually also reported greater engagement with the news and politics um, at 18 and 19 years of age. So just to sort of um, put this a little bit also into context of action, um, there was a, a commentary done on the scoping review um, this was done by Constance Flanagan, and their um, commentary looked at some proactive practices that could be done to support youth um, based on the findings of the scoping review. So one thing that they highlighted was emphasizing that humans of all ages can be part of solutions. So that's something that's supported by a lot of the theoretical works. Um, so a lot of the theoretical works were done um, by, you know, developmental psychologists, and they were finding, you know, emphasizing that um, there, you can be part of the solution no matter your age, and also, you know, really validating um, feelings is important. Uh, again, working together to avoid a sense of being alone. So this really ties into the sense of intergenerational um, justice as well like it's not on the shoulders of children that you know this needs to be an intergenerational um, issue and that you know children need to see um, other generations also taking action and also a focus on local place um, was cited as important um, i would follow from these uh, wonderful 
this wonderful commentary that also as we move forward um, and these actions are taking place and we are you know, trying to support young people that we need to be evaluating these um, in order to know from, in order to have a good strong evidence base and to make sure that we are not potentially um, exasperating issues. So it's also important to note that, um, that it can be a bi-directional relationship. It could be that young children who are you know, engaging in action could then be feeling overwhelmed by the burden of that action, particularly not if it's not met by political change. So it's important to kind of follow these, um, these things up and make sure we're doing evaluations and understanding how young people are feeling um, through them. So just to sort of conclude um, this work in general, this field is in its infancy. It's really growing at this point. I think if I were asked to do this talk in five years, it would I would have much uh, a lot more empirical evidence that I would be reporting on at this point. Um, but that future work does have a really strong base to grow from. There's some very nice theoretical work out there um, trying to make sense of these issues. And, and we've seen a real growth in terms of empirical studies to sort of test these, these theoretical links. Um, and I think we just need more, um, and especially in terms of interdisciplinary and cross-national collaborations, because we need to move this field forward. Um, it's very evident that this is an important issue facing children today. And so we need to have, you know, collaboration from developmental psychologists, geographers, um, philosophers, epidemiologists to understand how this is impacting, um, you know, in larger national studies. So we need to move this field forward um, now, I would say. And I think that the best way to do it is through um, some interdisciplinary and cross-national collaborations and definitely including youth engagement and child engagement in all of our work. So thank you. I think I finished a bit early, but I will open up to questions. Um, I just put again the the special issue if you're interested. Um, this work was done with my colleagues at Western Geography. I'm at Athabasca and there's some very nice work um, coming from the Mental Health and Climate Change Alliance as well. If you wanted to check that out, that's run out of SFU. Um, and I've included my email and my Twitter name if you want to connect. So thank you very much and yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Tina, for such a wonderful talk on such an important topic. Um, there are a million questions coming in so that I know you're engaging <laughs> our students, which is awesome. Um, it's a real comfort to hear that uh, climate anxiety is a rational response to all the news that we are hearing, so that's a comfort. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate the you know really important and nuanced um, research agenda that your research charts. Um, so thank you so much.